Was Jesus really a carpenter? That's what we're going to talk about today in Mark 6. All right, so far the chapters have been relatively small. For whatever reason, Mark 6 gets very large, and so it has a lot of topics. We're not going to talk about, again, many of the topics we talked about in Matthew, but we're going to try to talk about new ideas, new things. You know, I learn new things, and I read new books about all these things, and so we'll bring them in as there's more information, or maybe just differing opinions. So Mark 6 starts out with Jesus coming back to his hometown. Disciples were following him. Now, we have to keep in mind that disciples could be many more people than the apostles. The apostles are named individuals, identified individuals, but disciples, there were a lot of them probably. Of course, it probably wasn't all of them because how would they fit inside his hometown? But now we're at the Sabbath. He goes over to the synagogue and people who heard him were astonished. But the quotes they say about it is maybe astonished in the wrong way, because what he's saying now is, where did this guy get all this stuff? Why is he so smart? How does he know all these things? Did he learn this here? How are all these things that he's doing, healing people that probably the word is out coming from him? You know, nobody respects anyone from your own hometown because you grew up with that person. They know you. You know them. You saw them trip in the schoolyard. I'm not saying Jesus tripped, but you know what I mean? You get to know people in your hometown, particularly if it's small, very well. Then they ask the question, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Hosus, Judah, and Simon? Are his sisters not here too? And it says now that they took offense at him. Like, how can this guy be telling us what to do? I'm sure you know who went off and became a rabbi, studied under certain rabbis. We don't know much about the childhood. But you get the idea, they don't dig this at all. And so Jesus says to them in ESV, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So he realized, I can't get anything done here. I'm not going to do anything here. And so he laid his hands on a few people, but not everybody, and healed them. And they were amazed at what he did. So the question comes in, just as a side point, because it's not that important to the whole topic, was Jesus a carpenter? And I mentioned the last time, the word itself actually means craftsman. We are very specialized now. We have plumbers and electricians. But back in those times, you had people who were good at building things, whether it was going to be with wood, which is what most people in Europe thought a craftsman was because they have trees and they work with wood quite frequently. Chances are he could do many things, stone building, building up roofs and houses, and again, carpentry. But he probably did many, many things because, honestly, stone is more common there in the time of Jesus than wood would be. We think of him as a carpenter, but he was probably a general craftsman. And the word is just poorly translated. It says that they were offended with him. He was too familiar. It's his hometown. So they knew everything about him. And so it said the important part of all of this in this whole conversation of what we've seen in Mark up to this point is that Mark is telling us in, he said, the most strongly worded way that the kingdom of the gospel is the kingdom that was preached throughout all of this time, that the kingdom of God is present in their hometown, is there with them. He is the kingdom of God. And his own people who knew him best of all couldn't see it. You also notice, too, that they said, oh, son of Mary, because it is bringing up the point, not Joseph's son. In many cases, the Talmud and the Midrash called him son of a named Roman soldier. So this is also just basically saying this guy is nothing special. Why is he being able to do all these things? So it was insulting for sure. So then Jesus sends out what it says are his 12 apostles. He calls them. He tells them to take, again, not very many things. You know, you take clothes on your back. Don't take any food, any bags, any money. Wear your sandals, have a staff and two tunics, you know, and then you go ahead and you're just going to get what you need as you go out into these towns. Part of it is that they said this was a sign. Because I guess when you brought a bag into a town and you were some kind of preacher, that meant you were taking up the collection plate. 
You are looking to squeeze them of money. He wants no sort of confusion here. He wants people to know they're just there to preach. Another point to bring out is he sent them two by two. Why two by two? Is that because the animals on Noah's Ark? Or is it just better that you have two? The Bible talks about how, you know, having a friend, how having a strand of people is always stronger. But it also means, too, that they can help each other out. Either going into some foreign mission area, some places that might not be so friendly to them. So I think it just makes sense. We don't have to dig too deep in order to see two. And the idea of bringing a staff. Now, in Matthew, I think I'm a hiker, right? So staffs make sense because you want to make sure you don't twist your ankles and that you stay healthy. And this is a really rocky area. I know I wish I had a staff. And this is kind of funny. One of the commentaries I read likes the guy, Crosan, who does the book the last week, which kind of irritated me on the Small Steps with God podcast. The idea is that these people are a little bit more that Jesus came here to disrupt the dominion status of government, which I don't agree with. But here, this commentary was quoting that same guy. And he said that a walking stick would indicate these are working men who has sticks, shepherds. You know, it's not a sword. It's not a staff like a king. These are just regular working people who are not all hoity-toity. Now, the reason I thought, as soon as I saw that commentary and that this guy likes those people who wrote the last week book, I thought, I was, oh, I'm going to take this out of my commentary list. And then I thought, you need things to challenge us. Don't just read commentaries and ideas that go along with your thinking. You need to be challenged from time to time. I need to be challenged from time to time. So I decided to keep it in because it wrote a very thorough investigation of Mark in general. I wanted not to just rule out things that I maybe disagreed with. And the walking staff idea made some sense. You go to a house, stay at the house until you're ready to leave the town. But if the place won't receive you, won't bring you in, won't give you a place to stay, won't listen to you, then it says, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. I've seen that in some Christian groups where they do that if they're done with you. It's meaning that we tried, we came, you're not interested. I don't even want the dust left on my shoes from this town. So it's, it's a rebuke of that area. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent. There we go. John said repent. Jesus said repent. And now the apostles are saying it too. They cast out demons and anointed people with oil, many who were sick and healed them. You anointed people, I mentioned before in Matthew, when they're kings, that's how David was made a king of Israel. He was anointed the king. And in this case, it was meant to indicate healing. And this oil probably would have been olive oil. And olive oil does have some healing processes. I don't know that that's why they picked it. So now we get to the death of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in jail for quite a while. So first of all, it starts out saying, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. King Herod is going to be his son. And he took on the name. He wasn't really a king. In fact, the Romans didn't want himself to call himself a king. He was a like a ruler of that area, but you didn't get to be king. Your dad was king, not you. I mentioned in Matthew, he seems confused. Like, wait a minute, is this Jesus guy? John the Baptist raised from the dead? He doesn't really even know who Jesus is. Like I said, his dad was detail-oriented, went and got scholars and scribes, and they investigated what was happening. But 30 years later, this guy, not that interested. He's like, hey, wasn't that that guy? He says, you know, I beheaded John, and now he's raised? Because what had happened, and it tells the story, is the, the story of they seized John. John said bad things about him marrying his brother's wife. We're not going to go on the whole story again. He was just confused about it. I think it's interesting he calls himself a king when he was not a king. It says in history books that even G Augustus, the emperor, denied him specifically the title of king. But he uses it anyway, probably because he called himself that when the Romans weren't looking. Then we get back to Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. The apostles came back. What have the apostles been doing? There's not much details here, but the Romans would have been impressed that Jesus took these people and sent them out. Because to be a main person in Rome, like to be seated with a king or an important person, you had to be educated, wealthy, you got tutored by the best tutors. But in this case, we see the apostles have that place next to Jesus. 
We don't go into the exact mission, but it said he sent them out to heal and preach to people to repent. We got the gist, right? So Mark moves on that he was going to go away to a desolate place. He wanted to go pray and be a little bit, you know, quiet to himself. But a lot of people were following him along. And when they followed him to this desolate place, no food. There's nothing to eat. There was no towns they could go to. And many people ran ahead of him along the shore. It says he had compassion on them. Again, this is a compassion that is heart-wrenching. I wish our language could support that kind of a word. But in the Greek word, it was a very emotional compassion. And it says, quote, because they were sheep without a shepherd. Mark adds that into this whole story. So he starts to teach them. The disciples came around and said, hey, this is a desolate place. Didn't you say to go to a desolate place? Well, desolate it is. It's late. Everyone's hungry. Send them off so they could go buy some food in the villages and everything else like that. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Why, what are we going to do? Are we going to buy 200 denarii? Again, a lot of money. They probably didn't have 200 denarii of bread and give it to them. And so Jesus says, go see how many loaves you have. And they found the five loaves and two fishes. He sat down, took the five loaves and the two fishes, looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples. And it divided into 12 basketfuls of fish. You know, it reminds me now that we got through with Matthew, when you look up to heaven and you say a blessing and you break the bread, boy, isn't that a lot like the Passover night with last night with Jesus? He's doing that same thing with them. So they all ate. I guess when you start healing people and producing miracles, people are going to follow you around everywhere. But the interesting thing is, is the apostles who have seen him do all these amazing things, heal people, bring people back from the dead. Suddenly he can't bring food. I know they didn't see him do it before, but you start getting the idea, this guy is powerful. You know, they just didn't see the possibility of miracles. And someone made up the interesting point, too, that it was Jesus that had him settle down and sit on the ground in the pasture, and he's the shepherd of the sheep. Okay. I don't know if that was meant to be, but what's interesting in Mark's telling of this is that he suggested that the disciples themselves should rest. That's great, because we also believe that our workers in the kingdom of God should also rest. And so he saw it not just as a place for him to get away because of his sadness, but invited them to rest as well. But there was no rest for him. The crowd followed them, and then they started worrying about the food. So despite this very nice, pleasant scene, a chance to get away and get some rest, nope, no rests. It's my vibe, too, that they were wanting to rest, maybe, but they're starting to get annoyed with a crowd that follows him everywhere. But was Jesus annoyed? No, he was the shepherd in charge of his sheep. It says immediately, there's our immediately again, may the disciples get in the boat and go out before him to the other side to Bethsaida. And he dismissed the crowd. He's their shepherd, so he can tell them to go home. And so when everyone left and the apostles are in the boat, he goes up to pray for a while. The boat was at sea. They were making headway painfully. This is ESV because the wind was against them. Again, we're at the fourth watch. So this is late. And I think after nine o'clock. And so then because they're not making any progress, the storms are coming out them. They become afraid. We see that in other chapters. Jesus is walking on the sea. It says he meant to pass them by. So he was just going to walk across the stormy lake. It says that when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out. They were all terrified because wouldn't you be? I'd be. And then Jesus ministers to them and he says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And so he gets in the boat with them. The wind calms down and it says that they were astounded. Because they didn't understand about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. We talked about this before, and I thought Father Mike Schmitz had a really good explanation of it that the sun can harden clay. It's hard, it becomes harder. It also can soften something like wax. In this case, it's not God making people harden, it's the message, it's what's going on that they're getting cranky and they didn't understand it and they didn't really want to understand it. And so their hearts were hardened. So the story is a little bit different than what we saw in Matthew, for sure. We think that this will be the account of Peter versus the account of Matthew. This is just kind of the differences of how the two saw it or what they took away from this message, whether their hearts were wax and getting melty or their hearts were hard and getting hardened. They end up landing not in Bethsaida, which is where they were going to go. They end up in 
Gennesaret, which is another place, which is a little bit closer. Someone brought the point. Is it because the apostles were getting blown off course too? And so they were blown off course just like the apostles? I don't know. I'm not sure about that, if that's the intent behind it or if it was just because the weather was so bad. But you can see that in this case, it's not quite as good as we thought it was going to be. They didn't get the fish. They didn't get the feeding. They were annoyed. And now they're in this boat and scared, but missing the entire point of all of this. These were his apostles. So someone brought up the interesting point. These were his apostles. They were already called. They had already been doing miraculous things. But to continue on your faith journey means to keep growing, keep taking risks, keep going after the information God is giving us, and keep learning and keep going beyond where it was. So then Jesus healed the sick in Gennesaret. It says that people, when they got off the boat, immediately recognized him. Immediately. It says that they ran everywhere. They brought people in beds and villages and the countryside and the city, put their sick people in the marketplace and begged Jesus to heal them. It said that they might even touch the fringe of his garment. And as many people as touched it were made well. Again, I don't believe in any sort of way that touching clothes heals a person. It is faith. It is Jesus. It is a gift from God. He was willing to heal them. But I think the word, you know, starts getting out. You can sort of see this as a game of telephone. That one woman, she touched his cloak and was healed. So the word gets out and they thought, oh, well, if we can get this healing cloak to walk our way, we'll get healed. But Jesus, because he has compassion on people, healed them anyway. That ends our very long, for Mark, chapter six. The thing I'm going to meditate about this time is about how the apostles got cranky about the whole thing. They didn't understand. Their hearts were hardened. I don't think God minds us questioning him, asking questions of him. It shows us that we're still engaged and having that interaction. But as soon as we get to that part where our hearts get hardened, that's where the trouble begins. I'm going to think a little bit about that. And so then my prayer in all of this is that I keep listening, I keep learning, and I never let my heart get hardened. That's my prayer for myself and my prayer for all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ or those who don't know Christ. I hope your heart doesn't get hardened. It is always bad news. What I'm going to share with other people is the fact that we always have more to learn. It is not like we become Christians, we go to our eighth grade Sunday school, and that's it. We're good. This is a continual process of growing, taking risks for the gospel, learning more, hearing more, and reading more. I mean, even in this whole Bible study, I have never done a Bible study this slowly, and I'm learning a lot from it. There's always more that God has to teach us. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you like this podcast, please think about writing a review for it. It helps the podcast get discovered in all the algorithms, at least that's what I understand it to be. And so it really helped me out that if you think this is a good podcast, it'd be nice to hear from you. Or if you have any feedback for me, I'm happy to listen to anything you have to say. And you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening. <music>